Hi guys, Olive here. Here today to discuss revenge stories, one revenge story in particular, and talk about why it is we seem to just eat them up. Let's talk about The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas, because I did not wear my favorite shirt of all time just because the candle of the month smells like sea salt. No, I also wore it because we're going to talk about revenge stories. So in case you don't know anything about this classic, it follows a man named Edmond Dantes. And when we first meet him, he's only 19 years old, but he's doing remarkably well for himself, both professionally and personally. Professionally, he is a sailor on a merchant ship. He's very high ranking. There's talks he may even be promoted again at such a young age. And then on the personal side, he is very close to getting engaged to the love of his life. His good luck ends there, however, because two men who are jealous of him for two different reasons, one a professional reason and one a personal reason, they conspire together to accuse Dante's of a crime that he did not commit. There is proof that he didn't commit this crime. It's a document. And when Dante's presents that document to a public prosecutor, that prosecutor destroys the document to protect himself from something else entirely. And so at that point, Dantes is really and truly screwed. He spends 14 total years in prison before he gets the opportunity to escape. And then he goes on to find this enormous fortune. I won't talk about the details of how he does that. That's actually my favorite part in the book, so I don't want to spoil it for you. But let's just say that it gives off some Shawshank Redemption vibes. There is a reason this book is mentioned in that movie. It's at that point he decides that he's going to use his newfound freedom and his newfound wealth to exact revenge on the three men who took his life away from him. He is going to be what he calls an angel of providence. He's going to set things right and he's going to give those men what they have coming to them. I would more call his actions serpent strikes of karma, but I know that definitely does imply that everything he does is negative, when really the first thing that Dante's does when he rejoins society as a wealthy man, he does right by the man who was loyal to him. He does right by him and his whole family in a really big way before he figuratively stretches his muscles and gets ready to go in on the traitors. What follows that couple hundred pages worth of setup is the most complex, well thought out roller coaster ride of a revenge story that is full of a seemingly meaningless detail that is actually very meaningful and all of these interwoven webs of deception how one man Edmond Dantes could come up with such a meticulous plan and then have the patience to carry out that plan over many years like this is a very long period of time that we're talking about in the count of Monte Cristo it's just mind blowing. I mean, not everything goes according to his plan, but a whole lot of it does. And it's quite spectacular to behold. I'm not going to talk about any more details about his plan or about this book in general, just in case you haven't had the chance to read it. I really wouldn't want to spoil anything about this book for you. You really have to experience it for yourself. So if you're interested in this book based off of what I've said or based on things you've heard elsewhere, I really do encourage you to pick it up. It is intensely long, but it reads really quickly. You'll find yourself flying through it because there's so much going on. And I do think it's just great fun. But that's the conversation I want to close out this video with because I am so interested to think about why we find these types of books so much fun fun to read. They're not just interesting to read. They are intensely satisfying. And what's fascinating to me is that when we go into a revenge story, we all know we are all fully prepared that one character is going to suffer. Remove the argument that that character may deserve it, whatever that may mean. We know that a character in the book is going to meet with a ruinous end. And yet we crave it. And I think that's because there is a part of 
all of our brains, something embedded deep in the human brain without any exceptions, that we just know it's going to feel so good. It's going to feel like a mental massage when we see someone get what's coming to them. I think it's the reason why those instant karma clips online are so popular, where someone does something mean or rude and then just instantly gets punished for it. I think we've all been wronged before in our lives. I feel pretty confident saying to you watching this video right now, you've probably experienced everything from a minor slight all the way up that sliding scale to a devastating betrayal and then everything in between. So you know how helpless that makes you feel when someone does something like that to you that feeling like all the power has been taken away from you. You want to feel like you're getting that power back, especially in a situation like Edmond Dante's experiences at the beginning of The Count of Monte Cristo, where not only was he betrayed in a really huge way, but also he didn't see it coming. He didn't even know he had enemies. So it's that feeling of complete and utter helplessness. In my experience via situations that I've been in and situations that I've seen other people go through, it seems like the number one thing we as people want after being betrayed is to get our power back. We want to prove, I'm not going to be fooled again. I see who you are. I see what you're doing. This treatment will not stand and you're not going to get away with it. And we think that revenge is the way to go about that. Shameful as it is to admit, we want that other person to feel the same pain that they put us through. And we think the only way that they're going to understand is to feel it themselves. And we think if we're the ones to cause it, well, then that's just some universal karma. That's a balancing of the scales. And we want ourselves, the universe, or anyone out there to make that person feel the cold slap of justice or whatever we see as justice. But the thing is, revenge is very much a fantasy. I was recently reading some psychological studies about revenge because I'm a nerd and that's what I do in my spare time, but also because this book got me thinking about it and I wanted to do some more research. And there have been findings to suggest that when we think about getting revenge on someone, the reward centers of our brains, they're activated. And we know that to be true in experience because just admit it, doesn't it feel so good thinking about getting back at someone? And so if the opportunity to get revenge presents itself, we will most frequently take it. But when we seize that opportunity and act like an angel of providence, something strange happens. That good feeling we were just feeling, it doesn't stay. Instead, there are all of these new emotions. Now we're being preoccupied by thoughts, not just about that initial hurtful event, the one we were seeking revenge for, but also now we can't stop thinking about our retaliation. And we're thinking about both of those things at the same time, feeling the feelings of both of those things at the exact same time. We've not put a lid on anything. We've actually stirred the pot. And further, if the process of exacting that revenge causes us to act poorly in service of getting the revenge, it can create a cognitive dissonance because inside of all of our heads, we're telling ourselves, I'm a good person. Well, did we act like a good person when we were doing whatever it was we thought we needed to do to settle the score? Maybe not. Studies also show that if we're presented with the opportunity to get revenge and we actively choose not to take it, it can help us get over that initial hurtful event a whole lot faster. Your brain starts doing something called minimizing. You think to yourself, well, I could have gotten revenge on that person, but I chose not to take it. I guess whatever they did to me way back when, I guess it wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was if I didn't feel the need to get revenge for it. So it starts becoming smaller in your mind and therefore you can get over it faster. The summary of all of that is to say that while we think it's going to feel so good when we get our revenge, 
it normally just feels good to think about getting the revenge and that acting out those fantasies to act on any of those urges is probably just going to be stoking the flames of the emotional fire that you were feeling in the first place. It's not actually the best thing for you to seek out revenge. Really, the best thing you can do for yourself is to start to move on. But if we are all wired to think positively about getting revenge, then wouldn't it make total sense why revenge stories especially intricate and smart ones like Monte Cristo, it makes sense that those types of stories feel like a scalp massage. It feels so right thinking that the three men who took an innocent man's life away from him would pay for it. But when you stop to think about it, didn't Dante's give up a whole lot of additional life by focusing so much on getting revenge on these three men? Edmund Dante's lost the 14 years he spent in prison, and then he also lost the future that he had mapped out for himself at age 19. Those are the things that those three men took away from him and the reasons why he has set his sights on them. But what about all the additional years that it took to create these plans, to set everything up? That's not just to say the years of active scheming in front of all of these people's faces that we get to see in the book. We're also told that there are years of behind the scenes things happening that we don't actively see in the book. We're just told that those years have passed. This is a man who acquired the kind of wealth where he could just go out and buy himself whatever life he wanted anything his little heart desired, he could just go get it. It would be his in very short order. And yet he chooses to spend huge chunks of his time, money, and energy chasing down low lives. If I came into that kind of money, I don't think I would choose to spend it that way. But more than the money, it is devastating seeing him choose to spend his time doing this. Time is the most valuable resource we have. We only have so much of it. You can't buy it back. Eventually, all of our time will run out. And so we need to be really selective with how we use our time. And to see this character just handed over willingly to these men, it's heartbreaking, especially because seeing how these guys are, seeing how they act, they were probably busy digging themselves into early graves without any help from him. Is it fun seeing him declare open season on traitors? Oh, yes, it is. But when we look at it from a different angle, did Dante's really win? Probably not. But that's actually why I think revenge stories, revenge fantasies might be kind of helpful because we get to exercise that muscle, if you will, by reading a story about revenge. We get to bathe our brain in chemicals that feel so good when we think about revenge without actually taking it ourselves. We think revenge is a good idea. It's fun to think about, so it's fun to get lost in that story. And I think this is one of a million different reasons why reading is such an important thing in all of our lives. We also develop a familiarity with these types of situations by reading about them in books first. So if we are ever confronted with a situation where we might feel tempted to get revenge, we can think back on this situation that we lived out by reading through this book and determine whether or not Edmond Dantes was actually a winner in the end. That might motivate us to shy away from seeking revenge. But let me know what you think. Do you like revenge stories? If so, what do you like about them? And do you like The Count of Monte Cristo? And if so, what do you like about it? I would love to talk about any or all of this with you in the comment section below. Also in that description box below, there will be links to everywhere you can find me across social media and the internet in general, if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video video. Bye.